In this video, we're going to look a little bit further into the dimensions of a vector space, specifically subspaces of a finite dimensional space. Let's start with the theorem from our text that talks about a subspace of a vector space. So we have H, which is a subspace of a finite dimensional vector space V. The theorem tells us that any linearly independent set in H can be expanded to a basis for H. And then we'll get to that other part in a minute. So let's think about what this is saying. We have some vector space. Within it, we have some subspace H. And then we have a set in H. So not necessarily all of H. We've got some set S that is part of H. And the question is, or the theorem tells us that it can be expanded to a basis for H. So what we're saying is, let's say S is V1, V2 through VP. Well, what if this already spans H? Well, if this already spans H, then we're done because it is a basis. And again, linearly independent is key here because of course we know a basis must be linearly independent vectors. What if, however, it does not span? Well, if it doesn't span H, then this theorem tells us, which is sort of the counterpart to the spanning set theorem that says if you have redundant vectors, take them away. This is saying I can add, I can take S and add some other vector that is in H. And that could be now, obviously set S is V1, V2 through VP, VP plus one. And it could be now that it spans H. And if it does, then again, we're done. And if it doesn't, then we just do this again. We add the next one and the next one. And again, the key here is that this guy is also linearly independent of any of the vectors in S. And every time I add one, it's still linearly independent. So essentially I'm adding uh, vectors to that set until I get to a basis for H. And then it tells us that the dimensions of H is less than or equal to the dimension of V. Well, that one should be pretty easy to think about because we know that H is a subspace, which means the vectors within H are all within V. So we know we're not going to go past the number that is in V. So there is a, obviously more formal proof that you can do with that, but I just wanted you to understand what that theorem was trying to tell us. Now let's shift gears and talk about the null space and column space of A. Recall what we know about A. The pivot columns of A will form a basis for A. And since the dimension is just the number of vectors in the basis, then the number of pivot columns in A is equal to the dimension of column the column space of A. We also know from section 4.2 that in order to find a spanning set, we would have a vector for each free variable. So recall, I might have that X was equal to um, C1 and then 1, 2, 3, plus C4 and then 4, 5, 6. And so again, we would have a vector for each free variable. And therefore we know that the dimensions of the null space of A would be the number of free variables in A because there would just be one vector per free variable. So there's what we know. Let's take a look at an example. Let's let A be this matrix that I have written out for you. I want you to find the dimensions of the null space of A and the column space of A. So again, I already have here a pivot and a pivot and a pivot. And yes, I cheated. I gave you one that was already row reduced just to make things go a little faster. But here's what I know. I know that I have three pivot columns. I also know 
that this is a free variable. So what does that tell me? That means that the dimensions of the null space of A, and recall what we said, the dimensions of the null space of A is the number of free variables in the equation. So again, I've got one free variable, and therefore the dimension of the null space A is one. And the dimensions of the column space of A is the number of pivot columns, and I have one, two, three pivot columns. And hopefully we can tell just by the definition of the dimension of each that we're going to end up with the total to be the number of total vectors that we started with because each column is either going to be a free variable or it's going to be a pivot column. Here's one that's just a touch more difficult for you to do on your own, and it's just a touch more difficult because I'm making you actually do the row operations yourself to determine how many pivot columns we have and how many free variables we have. So once you've done so, answer the question, the dimensions for the null space of A and for the column space of A. When you're all done with that, press play to see how you did. Again, all I'm going to do is do my row operations. So I'm going to keep my first row the same. And my second row, I'm going to add rows 1 and 2 together to get 0, negative 1, positive 2, 5, and positive 1. And this guy already has a 0, so I'm not going to do anything to row 3 quite yet. So I know that's a pivot. So now let's continue. I'm going to take... All I'm going to do this time actually is I'm just going to make my second row and then I change all the signs. I'm taking it times negative one. I'm not going to do anything to row three. And I'm going to then use row two to simplify rows one and three because if you'll remember I want zeros above and below. So I have negative, I'm sorry, positive three times row two plus row one. So that gives me one, zero. Negative six plus negative four is negative 10. Negative 15 plus two is negative 13. And negative three plus zero is negative three. And I'm going to take my second row and rewrite it. And I'm going to take my third row and take negative 2 times row 2 and add it to row 3. So that's 0, 0, positive 4 plus negative 5, um, positive 10 plus 0, and positive 2 plus positive 2 is 4. So I'm going to then continue because I've got 1 and I've got 1. And I'm going to just do a little bit extra. Whoops. Wow. Let's see how many times I can switch back to white just for fun. So I've got 1, 0, negative 10, negative 13, negative 3, and 0, 1, negative 2, negative 5, negative 1. This is 0, 0, 1 negative 10, negative 4, and you might be asking, well, you did, did you have to do the last step? No, I didn't, but I'm a perfectionist, so I had to just get it all the way down to reduced row echelon form. What I have found out is that I have three pivot columns, and I have two free variables. So that makes it very easy to answer the question, which says the dimensions of the null space of A is equal to the number of free variables, which is 2, and the dimensions of the column space, sorry, the dimension of the column space of A is equal to the number of pivot columns, which is 3. And again, always a good idea to check. Yes, there were 5 to begin with and that adds up to five.